You'll recall two weeks ago, we, we started talking about the dangers of the tongue. And in chapter 3 of James, and James uses the tongue as a test of faith. Um, and he has several illustrations that he uses, but the tongue is one of those. Um, because James is kind of a, he's just a straight shooter, and he's, he's going to find out if our faith matches, if our works match our profession, our fruit matches what we say we are. In other words, we say we're a Christian, or we walk in the walk, or are we just talking the talk? And he just really doesn't pull any punches. He goes right at it. And uh, it's, it's a tough book to study, and, and it's, it's one that we all should take to heart to grow. True faith will be demonstrated by speech, and so will false faith. <laughs> James teaches us that faith, which does not transform the tongue, what he's saying, and we, we'll see here, is not a saving faith. If your salvation doesn't affect the way you talk, then it's not saving faith. That's hard, isn't it? But it's the truth. Salvation is going to change the way we talk. Now, not perfection, and we'll get to that, but, but we should be moving in the right direction, of course. So, therefore, controlling the tongue is essential. And... Uh, James gives us some compelling reasons why we need to control the tongue. And I'll just review quickly from a couple of weeks ago to catch us up. And just quickly, the, in verse 1, the first thing that James tells us is that the tongue has the potential, the potential to condemn us. And James's point points out that a man or a woman or whatever the case should not take on the role of a teacher unless he is certain that God or she is certain that God has called he or she. Because, and here's the reasons, teachers or preachers, people that do what I do and what Pastor Larry does on Wednesday, what Pastor Brandon does with the youth t teaching children, whatever the case may be, we are held to a stricter judgment. We have to be very cautious when we take on this role. And certainly we want more people to teach, and, and, but we should not take it lightly. It is a serious matter because we who teach or preach God's word will be more accountable because our words are affecting a lot more people. So if we get up and we proclaim we're teaching God's word, well, we shouldn't take that lightly. So that's the first thing. And then the second thing is James talks about in verse 2. He tells us uh, that, that the tongue has the potential to offend. Now, how many of you know that? <laughs> Boy, do it, I mean, the tongue can offend people, it can. And, uh, you know, I've heard that expression, you know, stuck my foot in my mouth. And I, I don't understand that expression. Somebody might have to explain it to me. Because I think putting my foot in my mouth might be a good thing so I can't talk. You know, so I, I, don't, I don't quite, I know what it means, but I don't really understand where it came from. But uh, we, we, we all, James is saying, we're all prone to sin. None of us are perfect. We know that. But, but the truth is we can grow in spiritual maturity. And, and an important gauge of our growth in Christ, of our maturity, is in our speech, how we talk. The control of the tongue, you could say it this way, is a barometer of Christian maturity. Wow. So a spiritually immature person would be one that does not control their tongue. A spiritual mature person is one that has at least <laughs> advancing in that control of the tongue. So that's, that's, that's what James is talking to us about. And then, of course, he goes on in verses 3 and 4 there to give us an analogy to point uh, a couple of them, actually to point, make the point that the tongue is small. This little thing is small, but it's mighty. 
uh, and he uses the uh, word pictures of the bit and the rudder. We put bits in horses' mouths, mouths that they might obey us. And, and a strong horse, very strong horse, can be controlled by a bit in its mouth. And the second analogy he uses is a large ship can be turned by a small rudder. So basically the tongue uh, controls or affects our lives. And that's what I want to kind of get to tonight and talk a little more about that. In our uh, text tonight, we, we will start with verse 6. Uh, and, uh, and here's what James says. He, he states it very directly. He's, he says, and the tongue is a fire. Wow. Think of that. An, a, a fire. A world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members that it defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature and it is set on fire of hell. Now that is a mouthful, folks. And the point is clear. The tongue can be deadly. It is a powerful source or can be a powerful source of evil that taints. And basically what he's saying here, it taints every part of, of our being. If we do not use our tongues with great caution, we are like, and here's the analogy he uses we're like a, a, a spiritual arsonist, lighting careless fires that cause widespread destruction, not only to others, but to ourselves. That's how powerful the tongue is. James is making a strong, <laughs> he's wanting us to know hey, that thing is dangerous. The thing behind your teeth caged in is very dangerous. James says that the one who is careless with his tongue defiles, defiles. That's what it says. Defiles the whole body. An unchecked tongue, he says, is the world of iniquity and it defiles the entire body. It's like a spark that lights a bigger fire. It not only defiles us. But it also sets on fire the course of nature or the course of our life. It's what it really means. The, it really kind of literally means the will of our life. The will of our life. I know I say a will. I'm talking about a, a, a W-H-E-E-L. The will of our life. If you have a careless tongue, it will damage your entire life. Do you think of that? Now, James doesn't talk about the positive aspects. He's talking about the negative aspects of the tongue because he's trying to show us the danger of it. And he's also trying to show us that a Christian shouldn't be, have an uncontrolled tongue. But there are positives uh, that can be, a tongue can be used in a positive sense. It, it carries, I mean, it carries a lot of power, the tongue. And, and, uh, but it, can, but it also, as James says, it can be used in a negative way. Now, I don't know if you've ever experienced the power of the tongue in a... I know you have. We all have experienced the power of the tongue in a positive way. I mean, I don't know how many times I may have been a little bit down. And maybe it was something to do with the church. Maybe the crowds were not as good. Maybe the offerings were really down. And, and you know, and... and, and uh, and uh, so, so I'm, I'm kind of down and just somebody starts talking to me and they just, they're very positive and they're just, they're just quoting scripture and, and they see that I'm down, but they just, they, they're, they're encouraging me and, and they're saying, you know, hey, pastor, uh, we can do all things through Christ. I mean, God's got this thing under control. It's going to be okay. You know, sometimes we go through a little, a little something or not, but God, there's on the other side, there's victory. There's something great. And you know, and you just kind of feel like, Wow. You know, and they may start quoting scriptures. Greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. And you start feeling that. You just, it changes. I mean, you like, you know, it changes the atmosphere. But I've had people when I'm down come and make me more down. Or I've had people when I wasn't down to bring me down. You notice, Pastor? Those Sunday night crowds aren't, uh, they're not as big as they were. You might want to change up some things. You know, this prayer thing's not working and... You know, and uh, you, you know, the offerings have been down, and uh, you know, so, and, you know, and I'm going, I'm like, it, the atmosphere went from bad to worse. 
You know, and, and in the Bible, and I just want to touch on this, and that's not what James is getting at, but just to show you there's a positive aspect. In the Bible, there was a law of warfare. There really was. And, and, and one of the laws of warfare was this in the law of Moses, that if somebody was fearful and faint-hearted, you were to go home. And why was that? Because you don't want to be in a foxhole with some chicken. You don't want to be in a foxhole with somebody saying, oh, I don't know what I'm going to do. Because you know what? He goes on to say that the reason for it, lest your brethren's heart also become fearful. Because in the foxhole with somebody that's a chicken, it's going to make you a chicken. You know? But you want somebody that's a warrior in the foxhole with you, don't you? Somebody that says, hey, we're going to do this, and we're going to do this. And, you know, somebody positive. And so that's the power of the tongue. It's the power of our speech. It can be used in a good way and in a negative way. And James is dealing with its use in a negative way. So he goes on to tell us. He takes it one step further here in this sixth verse and, and uh, at the end of it. And he identifies the source of of the problem of the tongue. He said, it's set on fire by hell. Wow. What he's saying, James, means an evil tongue, that is, is set on fire by the hellish spirit world of wickedness, falsehood, slander, blasphemy. It's set on fire of Satan himself. So that's the source of the problem. The tongue, my friend, is a, that evil tongue is a world of iniquity. And you think about this. Think about this. Most Christians, most people that go to church, they're going to, you know, if, if I preach on, you know, the sins of uh, homosexuality or molesting children or murder or, 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 or say the satanic cults or whatever the case. I mean, everybody's saying amen, and we're like, you know, we know that's wrong. And, and, then, and we shrink back from those sins ourselves. And, you know, we're not, we don't want uh, to, to uh, hate the sinner. We love the sinner, but we, we just like that. Those sins repulse us, don't they? Child molestation, I mean, ah, goodness, who could do such a thing? Homosexuality, I mean, we don't understand that. You know, who got involved in a satanic cult? You know, we, we, we shrink back from that. But, you know, we tolerate gossip, slander, deceit, half-truths, sarcastic put-downs. And other sins of the tongue, like they're no big deal. But let me tell you, James says they are a big deal. They are a big deal. James says that all those sins that, you know, of, of the, that we've just mentioned of the tongue have their origin in the pit of hell. They defile the one that commits them, and they destroy other people as well. They defile them. The, the word defile means to stain. You ever seen somebody that's just bitter? Everything they say is just bitter, and they're stained. And anybody that gets around them very much, they're stained by it because it affects the people. It affects people. So... James goes on to use an analogy from the animal world. Now, he's kind of used the analogy of a bit and rudder, and he's talked about, you know, even you could say, you know, starting a fire, an arsonist. And, and now he's talking about the tongue, and, and he uses the analogy of the animal world. He says in verse 7, For every kind of beast and of birds and of serpents and of things in the sea is tamed and hath been tamed of mankind. But, listen to this, but the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. <laughs> Man, James has no mercy on the tongue. He just makes me want to cut mine out. I mean, he's like blasting the tongue, isn't he? You know? <laughs> so, I don't know if you've ever been to SeaWorld. Some of you have been to SeaWorld. I'm sure you've seen the trained whales and dolphins and seals. Some of you have probably been at a circus and you've, you've seen the, the, the elephants, the lions and the tigers that have been trained. But James says, there's one beast that cannot be tamed, the human tongue. And he adds, it is an unruly, and the word means unruly, it's an interesting word, it means unsettled. And according to, the, to Thayer's Greek lexicon, it's an interesting definition, he says, restless. 
It's, it's, it's restless. It's a restless evil full of deadly poison. Being restless means that there's never a time when it relaxes. Never a time when it's sleeping. There's, oh, it's always ready to strike. It's, it's what he's saying. It's, it's an unruly evil. It's a, it's, it's a restless evil, that tongue. So you have to always be on guard against it. Being full of deadly poison, you should handle it cautiously as you would a vial of anthrax. So James, now I want you to understand, James does not say that the tongue is untamable. He says that no one, he's saying no, uh, no, no one can tame it. He's not saying that, that it's, he's, what he's saying is it's humanly untamable. And, and the truth is only God can tame the tongue. We can't tame it, but God can tame it. Now, James makes this statement because he wants us to get a clear view, and he has done a good job. I don't know if I've done a good job of, of, of conveying it, but it's a horrible monster that we have to do battle with. So, but here's the thing. When the Holy Spirit controls your heart on a daily basis, over time, the fruit of the Spirit will appear. And what is the fruit of the Spirit? Things like love and patience and kindness and gentleness and self-control. All of those relate to the control of the tongue. In fact, tongue is the great indicator. The great indicator in our life that, that, that uh, we already said of spiritual maturity, but the tongue reveals, it's a tattletale. You know that? The tongue will tell on you. It's a tattletale. It tells what you have in your heart. Think of it. Now, I'm talking to me here, and I'm like, oh, my goodness, it does. It tells on us. It's a tattletale. So, to tame this a terrible tongue, you have to walk daily in the Spirit, taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Ultimately, an evil tongue, and I've already said it, is the tool of an evil heart. So let's talk about this for a moment. Let's, 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 let's talk about it. James makes a final point here. And I want us to look at this because I think this is where he's getting at that, you know, it really is an indicator of where you're at in the Lord. He says in James chapter 3, verse 9, Therewith bless we God. What do we bless God with? A tongue. Our tongue, right? There, therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men which are made after the similitude of God or the likeness of God, out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. He says, my brethren, these things ought not so to be. Doth a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? And can the, the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries, either of vine figs? So can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh. And so James is pointing out the gross inconsistency that he no doubt had observed with people. Christians will say, and we know this, Christians will say, praise the Lord in one breath, and in the next breath, they will say evil things about somebody else. Right? They sit in church, and they sing hymns to God, and no sooner do they get out the door that they begin to whisper, did you see so-and-so? Huh? She makes me sick. <laughs> he makes me sick. That pastor makes me sick. She's such a hypocrite. Or, 
Do you know what she did? Come on now. I've been the freshest with... with <laughs> I've been there. Wendy's. Old Charlie's, wherever you go afterward. Dairy Queen. Taco Bell. So James gets very direct. I could just, you know, we, you get the picture, right? We're at church, we're praising God, glory, hallelujah. He's wonderful, Jesus, and I can't stand her. Huh? You young people would never do that, would you? Huh? James says, and he gets very direct, my brethren, these things ought not to be. This, this should not be happening. This, this shouldn't be going on. This is not right. Then he points out that what often happens among Christians in this manner is just contrary to all of nature. The same spring does not send out fresh water one minute and then bitter water the next. It's just contrary to even what nature. He, he, he asked rhetorically, can a fig tree, my brethren, produce olives? Or a vine produce figs? He said, ne neither can salt water produce fresh water. And it all takes us back to James chapter 1 and verse 26. I want to read this. Now remember, James is direct. He's direct. I am not direct. I'm just saying what James is saying, okay? Let's look at it. If any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. Wow. Well, Pastor, are you trying to de-Christianize all of us? No, I'm not. I'm just telling you what James said. I'm just telling you. He said these things ought not to be. And I'm going to tell you, folks, that if you want the blessings of God and you want to grow in God and you want to be what God wants you to be, you got to take this. You have to take this serious. We all need to take it serious. You know, again, we shrink back from certain sins, but with these others, we, we don't seem to think it's that big a deal. But it is. The Holy Spirit gave James the words to say here. And so, that's pretty strong. That's pretty strong words. I'll let it speak for itself. Here's what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 12, verse 34. He said, O generation of vipers, how can ye, being evil, speak good things? Kind of saying, same thing that, that James was saying, you, you, you can't. It, it, it doesn't add up. He says this, For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. The mouth's going to speak what's in the heart. So if there's jealousy in the heart, guess what? The mouth's going to speak it. If there's bitterness in the heart, guess what? The mouth is going to speak it. Right? If there's pride in the heart, guess what? You got it. Jesus also said in Matthew chapter 15, verse 18, but those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile the man. He's, James is going along here with what Jesus said, right? It, it's, it's a heart issue. And what you say that comes forth from your heart defiles you stains you so the mouth is simply the opening that vents whatever is in the heart if there's raw sewage in your heart there'll be raw sewage gushing gushing from your mouth <laughs> again there's nothing more telling on the heart than the tongue and proverbs chapter 4 verse 23 tells us exhorts us Keep or watch over or guard thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. 
So it's not that we should cut our tongue off. It's we got to get the heart right. Because what's in the heart is what's coming out with the tongue. So James and Jesus, they're pinpointing the issue. It's, it's a hard issue. That's why we say the things we say. It's because it's in our hearts. You all want to grow in the Lord, right? You got to have some of this if you want to grow. We got to have it. We need to be reminded. I need to be reminded. I'll stand first in line. Have you ever thought about how terribly embarrassing life would be? <laughs> Boy, this would be. If, if there were a direct open line between your thoughts and your mouth <laughs> so that you blurted out loud whatever you were thinking. <laughs> Ooh, boy. Did they make a movie about that or something? I mean, instead of your polite, I'm pleased to meet you, out would come, I couldn't care less about meeting you, pal. Ooh, that'd be bad, wouldn't it? Or after listening to someone go on and on telling a story or something, and instead of you saying, yeah, that's, that's very interesting, you just blurt out, how can I get away from this bore? <laughs> huh? What do you think about it? Now, <laughs> I'm not suggesting that we should abandon politeness and become brutally blunt. I'm only pointing out that even if you control your tongue, you still have a heart problem. Does that make sense? You may control it, but it's still in your heart. I'm so glad that my thoughts don't come automatically out in my tongue. And I'm so glad it doesn't you, especially when I'm preaching. Because you might say amen, but you might be really wanting to say something else. You know, I don't know. All right. I, I'm going to start wrapping this up, but I... I I want to really make the point tonight about this because, again, if we really want to grow, if we're really serious about our Christianity, we got to hear these kind of words. We need to hear it, and we need to pray about, about it and ask God to help us. Rabbi Joseph Telushkin, if I'm saying it right, he lectures all around the country on, on the, or he used to at least, on the powerful and often negative impacts of words and I think it's interesting what he asks audiences. He says, he, he says if, if, if you can go for 24 hours without saying any unkind words about or to anybody, he, he was saying basically, can you do that is what he was saying. Can you go 24 hours? Now think about this. Can you go 24 hours without saying anything negative about somebody? Something that you shouldn't say for 24 hours. This is, this is the question he asked. And, and, and he says, invariably, a minority of listeners raise their hand signifying yes, and some laugh, and quite a large number call out no. And he responds, those who can't answer yes must recognize that you have a serious problem if you can't do that for 24 hours. He says, if you cannot go for 24 hours without drinking liquor, you are addicted to alcohol. He says, if you cannot go for 24 hours without smoking, you're addicted to nicotine. And he says, likewise, if you cannot go for 24 hours without saying unkind words about others, then you don't have control over your tongue. <laughs> I thought that was interesting. It's an interesting test. <laughs> Are you a tongueaholic or something? If you want to tame the terrible, potentially terrible tongue, I should say, the place to start, and we've already learned this is in the heart. Ask the Holy Spirit, and I mentioned this last time, and I cannot emphasize this enough. Ask the Holy Spirit. To fill your life. Ask Jesus to fill you with the Holy Spirit and walk daily under His control. Ask Him 
Let me just say this tonight before we leave this place. Would you have the guts to ask the Holy Spirit to convict you when you're about to say something you shouldn't? Because I want to tell you, friend, he'll check you right in the middle. And you'll have a choice to make. But he will do his job. Remember Ephesians 4.29 says, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. A positive thing the tongue can be. I mean, when we preach the gospel, is that not positive? Oh, But listen to what verse 30 says. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. Do you know what that's saying? We grieve or we sadden the Holy Spirit when we speak evil. But when we minister grace or we minister grace to those who hear when we speak good things. I don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit. But how many times has he checked me or you? And we went on and said something we shouldn't say. You know what you've done? You've grieved him. You've saddened the Holy Spirit. Because you went ahead and did it. And why do you want to do it? It's in your heart. There's a reason why you want to put everybody down. Because you want to lift yourself up. There's a reason why you like to brag about how great you are. There's a reason why... You, just the jealousy in your heart that causes you to say the things you say. Come on now. Am I telling it right? It's a hard issue. We got to grow here. We're not going to be baby Christians around here. We're going to grow. We're not staying in the playpen. There's a battlefield we need to be in. So we got to learn how to be victorious in these things in our lives. Remember what we say affects others and it can defile others and defile ourselves but it can also minister grace to others now i didn't talk enough about that but you can use that tongue in your speech to minister grace um i, I want to close with the words of uh layman strauss and <laughs> i just think it's a good way to end this he's kind of like james here he let me just read what he says he says stop it i can hear him saying it Oh, fellow Christian, let us stop it. We have no right to utter an unkind word, ill-tempered word against any, even if that person has wronged us. Leave those who have injured you in God's hands. That's good advice. Boy, is that hard to do. Boy, is that hard to do. Boy, is that hard to do. But here's what the Scripture says. And, and if, you, if you have this, Clint, the Scripture that I told you at the end, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. Let him take care of it.